Thanks, Helen, and thanks everyone for having me and for coming along. It's a real pleasure and an honour to be here in the Lake Tyres Hall for Stories of Influence this weekend. Uh, I'm, my talk is going to be, on the surface, quite different to what we've been talking about for most of the festival so far. Um, but as Helen suggested, there are, I think, some common themes to what we've been discussing, themes about connections across land and connections across culture. Um, and those connections come through the story that I told in my book of a bird called the Eastern Curlew. Before we get to that story, before we get to that connections, those connections, it's useful and necessary and important to know what exactly an Eastern Curlew is. Um, it's a bird, obviously. I'll tell you a little bit about how it looks. It's about the size of a chicken. It has very long legs and a very long, slender, curved bill, which it uses to winkle down into crab burrows and things like that. Uh, it has a sort of brown and mottled plumage. If you look at the feathers closely, it's got a lovely sawtooth pattern. So that tells you what, what the bird looks like. But what, a, what an animal looks like is really just a fraction of what it is. So let's scale back a bit. The eastern curlew is a migratory shorebird. Now, we all know what migratory means. What's a shorebird? We sometimes also call them waders. So what's a, what's a wader? Now, you'll be familiar probably with some of the small little birds you might see on the beach here, like the little red-capped plovers or even the hooded plovers. If you're not familiar with those, you might be familiar with the oyster catchers and you'll almost certainly be familiar with the masked lapwings, which make a lot of noise and have a habit of nesting in the middle of roundabouts and places like that. Um, these birds are all shorebirds, but they're not migratory shorebirds. They're resident shorebirds, so they'll spend their whole life in the one small part of the world. You know, the red cap plovers will spend their whole life on the same stretch of beach. They'll never go anywhere else. And most shorebirds around the world, most waders around the world, are like that. They're resident. They stay put. There are about 100 species worldwide of shorebirds that follow the other extreme of lifestyle, and they're migratory shorebirds. And fully a third of the species worldwide of migratory shorebirds are found in Australia at one time of the year or another. When I say migratory, I really mean migratory. These birds travel a long way. Uh, they will have just arrived a few weeks ago in Australia, in fact, just yesterday on the bird walk in the, in the distance, I saw a flock of them wheeling around above the lake. To get here, they will have travelled from their breeding grounds, which are in Siberia. They will have travelled down through East Asia, through New Guinea, into the north coast of Australia, and then filtered out around the coast. Some of them continue even onto New Zealand. And then in a few months' time, in March or April next year, they'll turn around and they'll do it all over again and go in the other direction. And they'll do that every year, twice, in each direction, for the lifespan of these birds is as much as 20 years, maybe 25 years. Um, they're colloquially often called moon birds because in, this, in the span of their life, they will fly the equivalent of the distance from the Earth to the moon. <laughs> um, that the distance of that migration, even that only hints at the extraordinary lifestyle and life cycle of these birds. They don't just fly a long way from their non-breeding grounds in Australia to their breeding grounds in Siberia. They fly almost non-stop. Um, so before they leave Australia, they will mostly or mostly gather in Roebuck Bay, just south of Broome, which is Yaru country. There they'll feed up, and that's a sort of staging area, and from there they'll launch on their migration northwards. 
from Roebuck Bay and from Australia, their next stop, the very next place they land after taking off from there, is the Yellow Sea between China and Korea. They fly over all the land in between here and there. They stop there, and even that is only part of the journey. They stop there, they refuel, they feed up, and then they continue on to their breeding grounds. And then they, they're in the breeding grounds for after all this effort, all of this migration, all this flying, they're in the breeding grounds for only six weeks. And then they turn around and come all the way back down here again. So that's, that's the migration. Even that is still only a part of the story of these birds and how extraordinary they are. We know from observing them and from the structure of their wings, we know that they're not soaring birds, they're not gliding birds. You'll see the pelicans flying around here, they soar on the thermals, they can go a long way with really no effort. Shorebirds can't do that. They can only fly by flapping. So that entire distance from Roebuck Bay to the Yellow Sea in one leap, from the Yellow Sea to Siberia in another leap, they're flapping the entire time. Now, so remember, they're flapping, they're flying thousands of kilometres at a time, and they're not stopping. There was... The, the eastern curly, which, which I wrote about, is the largest migratory shorebird in the world. There's a species which is a little bit smaller, called a bar-tailed godwit. There was a famous bar-tailed godwit codenamed E7, and she was a female godwit. She was satellite tracked, flying on the southward migration from the breeding grounds in Siberia to New Zealand in a big arc over the ocean. So not even a straight line, in a big arc over the ocean a distance totaling 11,000 kilometres, one flight, no stopping, flapping the whole way in nine days. <laughs> so now you've got a bit more of an idea of why these birds are so extraordinary and why they're so compelling. There's still more. <laughs> in order to undertake these phenomenal migrations, obviously they are extraordinarily energy intensive. Uh, so before they leave, the birds will feed and feed and feed at every available opportunity. They feed on intertidal mudflats mostly. So whenever the tide is out, whether it's day, whether it's night, doesn't matter, the birds will be out on the mudflats feeding on anything they can find. They do that to put on fat, which is the fuel for their migration. So when they are ready to migrate, they will have put on 80% of their own double body weight. So they've almost doubled their own body weight in fat, which is the fuel for their migration. If you, if you see them when they're just about to leave, they look like balloons that are about to burst. And you think, how can this bird possibly get off the ground? But they're in fact at peak fitness at that time. That fat will then get burnt off and then they'll land and, at the Yellow Sea and then feed up and put on more fat and then fly up, up to the breeding grounds. Not only do they put on weight, they also shed weight in a particular way. The organ systems that these birds aren't going to use on their migration, so their reproductive system, which they're not going to use while they're migrating. It'll be very important when they get to the breeding grounds, but not while they're flying. Their digestive system, which again, they don't use while they're flying. Their kidneys, there's an excretory system, which they don't use while they're flying. These organ systems shrivel up to almost nothing. They almost disappear. All that to save a few precious grams of weight that the birds won't have to carry and to make a bit more room in the body cavity for a bit more fat for the fuel for the migration. And then when they land in the LOC, the, the digestive system then grows back very quickly and the birds feed and then it shrinks again they, up, to the, up to the breeding grounds. Everything grows back and they get down to business. All the while, they're also molting into an entirely new plumage, an entirely new set of feathers. When we see them in Australia, they look very sort of drab and brown and grey. Um, they're quite sort of subtly beautiful when you see them up close, but they're, they're not like parrots. They're not like songbirds. They're not spectacular. They are very well camouflaged out on the mudflats where they feed. 
before they migrate, they just start to molt. If you're very lucky, you might see a migratory shorebird in its full breeding plumage, and they look spectacular. They suddenly molt into all these beautiful ochres and oranges and brick reds and deep inky blacks and greys and gold. They're just beautiful, beautiful birds in their breeding plumage. And they really stand out on the mudflats. When they get up to Siberia, that colourful breeding plumage becomes extraordinary camouflage on the tundra, on the lichen, in, in, down in, in the amidst all the dwarf bushes and things. If you see a photo of a migratory shorebird on its nest, it is almost invisible. And this is very important because they nest on the ground. They barely build a nest at all. They scrape a little hollow in the ground, lay eggs there, then rely on being hidden from any predators that wander past. The breeding, the breeding grounds are... They're a very productive place. So we associate um, the Arctic and the subarctic regions with cold and ice and snow and dark, which they are for most of the year. For these six weeks in June, July, there's 24 hour sunlight. All the plants are growing 24 seven, shooting out berries and new leaves and nice things to eat. The meltwater, so the, the ice and the snow melts and the meltwater forms huge wetlands, huge swamps in which insects like mosquitoes breed in their billions. This creates a fantastic feast for very hungry birds. Um, feeding up there in the peak season is a matter of the birds opening their bills and a feast flies in. There's no skill involved, um, which is fantastic for birds that are only going to be there for six weeks, which need to get down to business for six weeks. Um, by the way, in the breeding grounds, the male birds, to prove their fitness, because just the fact of this extraordinary mi migration flight is not enough, they have to go to a bit of extra effort, so the male eastern curlews will, on the breeding grounds, fly 15 metres up in the air, call in the whole way, a bit like a, a, bit like a skylark, a bit like a very large skylark, and then come down again to impress the females. Um, so the birds arrive there, they get down to business, the males display, they eat, they, they breed, the, the eggs are incubated, and then the eggs hatch, and then from the moment the eggs hatch, the chicks are what's called precocial. They can pretty much look after themselves. They can run around, they can feed themselves. The parents don't do much by way of raising them. They'll sort of cast an eye over, make sure everything's okay, and then the parents take off, and the parents fly down, down south. This is the last and perhaps most extraordinary, for me, element of the life cycle of migratory shorebirds such as the eastern curlew. The chicks hatch, essentially raise themselves, feed themselves, grow very quickly, fledge into their flight feathers very quickly, undertake their first long distance migration south to Australia without parental guidance at six weeks old. <laughs> so, I hope that gives you some idea of why I felt compelled to write a book about these birds. Um, on that note, I've got, while I'm talking about the next bit, I'm going to pass this around. I found this exactly a year ago in Shoalhaven Heads in New South Wales. This is the flight feather from an eastern curly. When they land in Australia, their feathers are worn and ragged, and they molt and grow fresh new feathers. Um, it's a bit tattered because it's been in my back pocket and also I've been carrying it around everywhere for the last year. So ignore all the, all the mess down there. But what I want you to look at is if you look very closely at the tip, you will see that the feather there is worn down and just a bit whitened and just frayed. And that's enough to make it too damaged to be usable anymore. When you, when you look at that and when you look at that wearing and that damage, just imagine that is from the friction of flapping for 10,000 kilometres. So that's why these birds are fascinating to me. Unsurprisingly, that also makes them fascinating to many other people. And so when I wrote my book, I wanted to find out what 
if anything, these birds meant to other people. They fly through many countries, they fly through many different cultures. I wanted to find out how people had responded to them. Um, I, I interviewed artists and theatre makers and, and people like that. Um, I also travelled up to the migration route, up to the, up to the Yellow Sea in particular. And I wanted to travel up to the Yellow Sea because in the course of researching my book, I learned that the Yellow Sea is the site of a lot of, of trouble for these birds because there's one other very important and very significant fact about migrating shorebirds and about the eastern curlew, and it's the worst fact of the lot. And it's this, that many of these species are critically endangered. The population loss of many migratory shorebird species is as much as 8% of the population dying every year. The eastern curlew, this population loss has been 88% in the last 30 years. That's an extraordinary rate of loss for any species. And the reason for this rate of loss is very simple. It's because of habitat loss and habitat destruction. Um, it's important to emphasise habitat destruction because we have a lot of very passive words, passive ways that we use language to talk about the, the era of species extinction that we're going through at the moment. We talk about things like population loss and population decline and habitat loss and it's as if these are things that just happen. But they're not things that just happen, they're things that we do. So it's not population loss, it's not population decline, it's population killing. It's not habitat loss, it's habitat destruction. The crucial habitat for the vast majority of migratory shorebirds is intertidal mudflat. Uh, these are, although they don't appear like much to us, they are in fact extraordinarily rich ecosystems. Beneath the surface of that mud, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of clams and shrimps and worms and snails, lots and lots and lots of invertebrate life, all hidden beneath the mud. As you can imagine, for a bird that follows an extremely energy intense lifestyle, that's a fantastic resource to feed, to feed upon. Um, and so intertidal mudflats are very, very important or crucial for migratory shorebirds. They're also habitats that we don't tend to value very much. Um, mud is not a good word in the English language. We have no positive associations with the word mud. Um, we tend to view mud flats as Wastes, wastelands, really wastes of spaces. You know, we have we all, particularly in Australia, we want to live by the coast. We have you know, very romantic att attachments to the coast. We've got a very particular idea of what we think a good coast should look like, and it's golden sandy beaches, it's lovely rolling surf, and it's deep harbours, wide mud flats, and shallow seas. Not many of us really want to live. <laughs> in those environments. Um, and so we, we tend to destroy them. Um, in the Yellow Sea in particular, the mudflats have really been destroyed in a big way. Something like 80% of the intertidal mudflats around the Yellow Sea have been destroyed. Um, and yet the mudflats up there are extraordinary. Um, I travelled up there in the northward migration season of 2016 and I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw some of the intact mudflats in the Yellow Sea in China and South Korea. Um, the mud is metres deep and the mudflats stretch for as much as 5 to 10 kilometres offshore. These are phenomenal habitats. Unfortunately, in China and Korea, much of the intertidal mudflat has been destroyed to make way for agricultural land, to make way for factories, to make way for ports. Um, and that, has, that is the one dominant factor that's driving the extinction of many shorebird species. 
one thing that we have when we talk about conservation in a wealthy and developed country like Australia is we find it very easy to point the finger at other countries and to say other countries need to save their habitat. Other countries, their population is growing too quickly, they're expanding. As I mentioned, a lot of the intertidal mudflat in the Yellow Sea has been to create factories and to create ports. A lot of that is to distribute the goods and to manufacture the goods that we buy here. Everything we find that in our shops is made in China, all the white goods and the cars that are made in Korea. Um, and so in a very real way, these birds are in danger and going extinct because they are in direct conflict with the mechanisms of modern 21st century global capitalism. When I was in the Yellow Sea, seeing this with my own eyes um, in, in mid-2016, it happened to be, just by chance, it happened to be at the same time as the 2016 federal election in Australia was called. So I was following the news in Australia and seeing firsthand this massive destruction of shorebird habitat to create the means to distribute and manufacture all the goods that we buy here. All the while, all our politicians back in Australia were talking about growing the economy, growing the economy, constant growth. Now we have a word for something in our body that grows unchecked, and it's not a good word. <laughs> and yet we live with this unquestioned doctrine that the economy and everything has to be constantly growing. What really came home to me in the, when I was in the Yellow Sea is that we tend to think of the economy as this amorphous thing that sort of exists on another plane. It's just you know, a thing. But an economy is bridges and ports and roads and factories and airports. It's concrete stuff. It's stuff that has to be built. And for anything to be built, it has to be built somewhere. And it has to take up space and it has to take up habitat and environment that was where that factory once was. So, yeah, it's very easy for us to sit here in Australia and say, China, Korea, they have to lift their game, they have to do better. But we are playing a role in why shorebirds are going extinct and why many other species are going extinct. And in fact, in Australia, we have an even more direct role to play. Um, we tend to think, and this is something that came, came across when I was talking to the artists and the theatre makers and people like that, we tend to think of where an animal breeds as its homeland. And as I was saying, the shorebirds are only in the breeding grounds for six weeks of the year. They're in Australia for six months of the year. That immediately asks the question, which country is more important in the, in the context of the migration route, in the context of the flyway that we're a part of? And in fact, one question that I get asked a lot is, well, are shorebirds native to Australia? Which country do they, do they come from? Um, in fact, in the course of writing and researching my book, I came across a poem by the Australian poet John Shaw Nielsen, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, who's widely revered as a great nature poet in Australia. He, write, he wrote a lot of deeply felt and very sensitively observed poems, particularly about Australian birds. And he wrote a book about the Eastern Curlew. And it's the most horrible, awful poem <laughs> that I've ever read in my life. He equated the Eastern Curlew with, and he was writing in the 1940s, and he equated the Eastern Curlew with immigrants, and he's calling it lazy, and he was basically saying this Curlew was coming here and stealing all our native birds' food. It was, it's a horrible poem. And so, yeah, I get asked, is the Eastern Curlew native to Australia? And the answer that I've come up with is yes and no. It's not native to Australia as such. It's not native to China as such. It's not even native to Russia where it breeds as such. It's native to the flyway. 
the flyway, the migration route, is its home. And it's, an, and it's a very important home. As, as I said, the eastern curlew is the largest migratory shorebird in the world. It's the largest of these phenomenal birds in the world. And of all the migration routes in the world, connecting up the southern hemisphere continents to the northern hemisphere, there's eight or nine of them across the world. They're called, of all the migration routes, of all the flyways, as they're called, the one that we are a part of, the East Asian Australasian Flyway, is the only one where eastern curlews occur. So the eastern curlew is endemic to our flyway, which I think puts the onus on us to work extra hard to protect it, and particularly because it connects us to countries that are far away from us and are culturally distant from us and yet are connected by the phenomenon of this, of this bird's migration. Um, and in the last couple of years, people working in the area of shorebird conservation have realised that actually Australia is a lot more important than we've given it credit for. All of the focus in conservation terms until very recently has been on the Yellow Sea, has been on China and Korea. The focus has switched very suddenly to Australia. You may have heard of a place called Toonda Harbour in, in southeast Queensland, 35 kilometres east of Broome. It's at the southernmost point of Moreton Bay. Um, there's been a, it's been in the news a lot in the last year or so. It's currently it's, it's listed under the Ramsar Convention as... A, as a site of, as a wetland site of international significance, and that's largely because of the presence of migratory shorebirds. It's a, it's a significant site in particular for eastern curlews. It's currently the subject of a development proposal, which will build in this small area that I walked through at the start of this year from one end to the other in ten minutes. There's a development proposal to turn to turn this small but crucial harbour into a marina and three and a half thousand apartments. Um, a freedom of information request from the Australian Conservation Foundation about a year ago found that Walker Corp, who are based here in, in Victoria, I believe, prior to putting in the application, in the year before they put in their development application, they had donated $25,000 to the state Labor government, $225,000 to the federal Liberal government. Lo and behold, the state Labor government supports this development. Josh Frydenberg, when he was Environment Minister at the time, this Freedom of Information request also found out that he had ignored on two occasions, not just one, but two occasions, advice from his, from his department, the Department of Environment, that this development application, which would destroy a Ramsar wetland, which would destroy a wetland that is crucial for the eastern curly, which was listed federally as critically endangered in 2015. The department told Josh Frydenberg twice that this application was clearly unacceptable. Both times he ignored that advice and pushed it up to the next level of, of approval. However, the community in Toonda, in Redlands, which is, which is the council, is working and pushing very hard against this, against this development application. They've managed to get it into the news, into the media. It was on Four Corners. They've got BirdLife Australia up there doing campaigns. And people elsewhere have, have heard that. Um, nearer to where I live in Melbourne, I spent a lot of time on French Island, which is a crucial site for the Curlies. In Western Port, there's a proposal by AGL to create a gas import pipeline that would build a 50 kilometre long gas tunnel from Western Port through to Pakenham, through the, through the heritage listed mangroves, the most southerly mangroves in the world, and discharge the wastewater from the, from the gas, the liquid gas regasification process into Western Port, which is a Ramsar listed site again, and, and a marine park. The, Again, as with Toonda, there's a community effort to save Western Port, which is what they call themselves, save Western Port. And they've been watching what's going on in Toonda very closely. And they've taken heart from it and they've taken inspiration from it. And in fact, prior to the last federal election, the most recent federal election, the Save Western Port 
community campaign was able to make it an election campaign for the for their seat and they they were able to get every candidate for the federal election across all party lines independents major parties minor parties everything every candidate agreed to sign a pledge that if elected they would oppose AGL's development and so the story of shorebirds and shorebird conservation is a story of of very much so in Australia and in in the Yellow Sea and elsewhere of small communities working to save the habitat and the environment that is close to them, that is physically close to them, that is emotionally close to them, to the, that they value. Um, and I know from talking to Helen that's a, that's a story that can resonate very strongly with the community here. Helen's told me about all of the community efforts to to stop various development proposals for the for the gorge um, and in fact just yesterday when, when we were on our bird walk um, I was I learned that the lake here is another Ramsar listed site um, which doesn't surprise me because I saw the shorebirds flying around and saw loads of other other birds um, and so yeah this idea of saving what is important and saving what other people and corporations and governments might not value, but what we value resonates from community to community to community. And again, it resonates not just in Australia, but all through the flyway, all through the countries that are connected by this migration route, by the migration of these birds. There is an infamous development in South Korea, midway down the west coast of South Korea. There was the single most important migratory shorebird site in the entire Yellow Sea in South Korea, which is the Samengum estuary. And about 10 years ago, the South Korean government completed the construction of the world's longest seawall. You can see it on the satellite, uh, 34 and a half kilometers long. With its one act of construction, it sealed off and killed the Samengum estuary. Um, there was a species of shorebird, migratory shorebird called the Great Knot, which is sort of about that big. It's one of the smaller ones. It, in particular, relied upon the Salmon Gum Estuary. That was its most important stopover point on the northern migration. Prior to the construction of this seawall, the Great Knot was listed as globally as least concern. With the one act of construction of this seawall, so many great knots died because they were no longer able to feed that in, in with, the, with that one act the classification went from least concern to critically endangered and yet when i was in south korea when i was in gunsan which is the town at the north of the seawall where i was when i was seen for myself the destruction of the seawall and the fact that not only has it destroyed the estuary but the development that the, that the Korean government promised was going to go into the, go into the land behind the seawall hasn't even happened. The, behind the seawall is now just a vast, stagnant lagoon with no life in it. Um, yet when I was there, I also talked to a Korean researcher, and he was a very interesting man. He was an ecologist and a shorebird researcher and also a sociologist. And he went around to communities counting the shorebirds in these coastal communities, but also talking to the communities. Because the history of shorebirds is not just a history of us getting out of the way and letting them do their thing. Where shorebirds find a resource, where the shorebirds find all the, all the animals to eat under the sea, people, of course, also find a resource. When you go out on any mudflat, Anywhere in the world, you'll see not just birds, you'll see people from the local communities there, from the small towns and villages there, out collecting shellfish to eat or to sell at market. And this has been going on for as long as people have been around. Shorebirds have been around for a lot longer than people, but for as long as they've been around, people and the birds have been side by side working these mudflats and gathering food on these mudflats flats. 
And so when mudflats are destroyed for construction, for factories, for everything else, it's not just the birds that lose out, it's the communities, it's the people who have traditionally gone out and collected the shellfish on those mudflats that also lose out. They lose their livelihood, they lose their traditions, they lose you know, what bound their community together. That, that was something that this Korean researcher told me and pointed out to me. He also told me that the Salmon Gum story, the Salmon Gum seawall and the destruction of that estuary has been so disastrous that in fact, paradoxically, paradoxically a little bit of good has come out of it. It's made people realise in Korea that actually they need to save the mudflats that they have. So it's meant that other industrial developments have been shelved in Korea. Um, Meanwhile, there are also organisations working behind the scenes. There's the East Asian Australasian Flyways Partnership, which has been doing a lot of lobbying behind the scenes. And a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, completely out of the blue, the Chinese government announced a moratorium on coastal developments, which is an extraordinary change of policy, an extraordinary development. In Australia, because we're so huge, because we're so vast, we tend to think that what we have is limitless. What we have will never end. Each piece of habitat for migratory shorebirds is crucial to those birds because they return to the same site year after year after year. We know that from researching them. And it makes sense if you think about it. If you're flying or if you're traveling vast distances, you know, if my, my family, when I was growing up in Canberra, we used to drive from Canberra all the way across to Adelaide, where my dad's family was, every Christmas. And we'd stop at the same places, at the same towns, at the same restaurants to eat on the drive the whole way, because we knew that was reliable. We didn't want to take a punt on trying somewhere new and finding it was terrible. And it's the same thing with shorebirds. They do these huge energy-intensive migrations they go to where they know food is going to be found. And at the start of my talk, way back at the start of my talk, I mentioned that there were 100 species of migratory shorebird worldwide. The reason there are so many species is each has evolved to feed on a slightly different niche within the mudflats. Eastern curlews with their very long bills, specialise in winkling down crab burrows and getting crabs at the end of the burrows. The great knots that I mentioned earlier, They've got shorter bills, they specialise in getting clams that are just a couple of centimetres under the surface. Other, other species specialise in picking things off the surface. And so often people who are in the business of destroying mudflats say, well, it's okay, the birds can just go elsewhere. But the birds can't. The birds won't. The birds don't. They know where the food is to be found. They go to the same places year after year after year. What that means is that you get numerous species feeding in parallel on different niches within the mudflat. But that also means that if you save one bit of mudflat, you're saving habitat not just for one species, but for many species. And you're also potentially helping to keep a, a community, a small community, hold on to what, what's valued and what it, what it values. Um, and yeah, I think that's a very important thing to, to keep in mind and, and to, to hold on to because what came through when I was researching and writing my book, when I talked to artists from Japan, when I talked to researchers in Korea, when I talked to bird watchers in China, when I talked to theatre makers in Melbourne, what they all said when they're talking about their work on the shorebirds, was that the shorebirds connect us all. Even though we, we may not be aware of it, even though we don't know it, just like the eastern curlew, just like the shorebirds, we might have our home in, in a particular part of this country, but our home is also in the flyway. We, we live in the flyway and we belong to the flyway, just as the birds belong to the flyway. And that way we belong to each other, I think. And what's good for the birds is good for us and vice versa.